Okay, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and begin our discussion. Uh, I want to handle any questions that we might have with respect to how you're setting up uh, your Excel uh, for forecast schedules. And then, uh, and then I want to talk about uh, kind of looking at the way we deal with adjustments once again. I think the assignment you have is a constant returns to scale assignment without adjustments, if I remember correctly. I want to talk once again about why do we deal with the adjustments the way we do. I want to review briefly then how all of this dovetails back into the concept of making decisions. Uh, because it seems very much like we're just modeling and doing some mechanical stuff, but it all has to do with making decisions within your firms, all right? Or the firms which you might one day work. And then I want to start to talk about another model form. I believe we've talked about the free cash flow model and the KVD model, in fact, at some length for both of them. But I now want to morph into yet another model form, okay, that you're going to at first think, oh my gosh, and you're going to realize, oh, it's the same thing. Oh, oh, okay. Um, so, what kind of questions would you have with respect to the Excel assignment? Now, let me ask another question first. How many of you have started the Excel assignment? Okay. And, and the rest of you, if you've been working on this in class with us, we went along last week, we're actually doing the Excel assignment uh, because it was the, what we did last week was the basis for the Excel assignment. So if you're doing that in Excel, then you've done more of the fun. So any questions about that assignment at this point or what you should be doing, how things should be set up to get the right outcomes? Cool. All right. So, so let's think about this for a second. I made, the, I made the recommendation that we look at a revenue to invested capital ratio and make an assumption about that, okay? And I'm just going to say that it equals x. You know, x is whatever the ratio, the multiple, if, if you will, is. And then I suggested that we look at a debt to invested capital ratio whatever that's going to equal, I'll say it equals Y. Why did we do that? What's the purpose of those assumptions? Please. That we assume certain financial elements grow pretty consistent with the ratios given on those two metrics. So okay. we use those for our projections. Uh, that's correct. So what elements is it, or what elements do we believe are subject to these ratios? Another way of asking that is actually, how do we use these ratios in our forecast? It's fine that we put up a cell there that says, this revenue times zero divided by this investment capital times zero equals this number. Okay, Anything divided by anything equals some number, right? So as long as you can define it. So uh, what's the purpose of these? How do we use them? Well, now you can calculate debt using invested capital right? or invested capital using debt. Right. So if we've got a ratio, and now we want to think about how we <coughs> identify or forecast debt, it equals that ratio times the invested capital for that period, right? So if this was for period one, and that's for period, excuse me, period zero, zero, that's our base year. But now I want to find a value for period one, or two, or 30, or whatever it happens to be. I can simply take the invested capital for that same period and multiply it by my ratio. So now I'm, I'm saying something when I do that, though. I'm saying that I believe that that ratio is constant, and that's in this case, if we're using debt, that's a bit of a uh, connected element to thinking about constant returns. That's not expressly constant returns. Constant returns is probably found more expressly here. But since this was dependent upon this, it has a dotted line connection to it, right? How is it that I'm saying that the debt divided by invested capital ratio is somewhat dependent upon the revenue divided by invested capital ratio. <coughs> How did we forecast invested capital 
for the first year of our forecast period. Yeah, yeah. So we used this, right? We went ahead and took the, to, to, we went ahead and found invested capital, which I think invested capital is equal to uh, what? Uh, revenue divided by X, right? So if I want the invested capital for time one, I find the revenue for time one, and I find that by using my sales or revenue forecast and applying it. So I find the, the invested capital for time one this way, and it's that invested capital here that I've used to find debt. So if you're doing it this way, you literally must let this execute first. Now, in Excel, it does it so quickly, you can't tell first or third, right? If you've got, the, if you've got it built in, it just uses it. So, so this is, this relationship leads to that relationship. That's why I say they're at least somewhat connected, if not directly a constant return issue. Okay? It's important that you get that. If we wanted in these elements right here to begin to introduce changing returns to scale, how might we do it? Please. Yeah, for a particular period, you could look at your ratio, and then let's say you think it's going to be 5% higher, right? You could find 5% of that and apply that to the ratio and use that. Exactly. Ratio. Exactly. So, so we're going to think about doing that first in our expense forecast ratio, because I want, I want to make sure you remember how to do that, and then we'll apply it here. Okay? So if I'm suggesting that I've got a forecast ratio for some expense category. And it might be all of my cost of goods sold, it might be all of my operating expenses other than e uh, depreciation, it might be any of my expense categories leading to operating expenses, all right? And let's assume for a minute that I've identified that that is 62%. And then I want to take a 1% adjustment. How do I do it to make sure that I've remained numerically consistent. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you stand down for a minute because you're great at answering questions. It's not that I don't like hearing from you. I want to force some of the other people. And you're pretty good at it, but you were the other hand raised today. So here we go. Actually, you're great at it, too. We'll let you, we'll let you just practice for a second, and then we're going to force other people. Will it just be applied in the first year, like the adjustment would be going to be 1 plus 0 0.01? Like you would, one you plus would add, zero one. like multiply times 1. Ah. Okay, so let's assume that the revenue uh, for year one, let's make it easy, let's say it's $1,000. Okay, so then are you suggesting that I would then take the 1,000 times 0.62 times 1 plus 0 0.01 to get my new expense factor? No. Good. That's what I thought I was hearing you say. I just wasn't 100% sure. So how would you do it? It'd be a, well, I mean, 62% is probably a little high. But, uh, well, but it is, we're saying it is what it is. Oh, okay. Then it'd okay. be 1,000 times 1 plus 0.62 times 1 plus 0.01, correct? Hang on a second. So it's 1,000 times 1.62 yeah. times what? 1.01. Anybody like to disagree with that, or are you good with it? Please, Alex. Um, wouldn't it be like times 0 0.99 instead of 1.01? Or? Well, I think that that would be one of the things. I have a problem with the first part of the term. Zach, do we like the first part of the term? Why not? Well, wouldn't you want to separate that and just you take like. 1.01 times the 62 and then multiply that by everything. So you want us to take, well, hmm, I heard what you said, I don't want to replicate it because I don't know that I want to do it. Let's think about this first. And, and, I, and I like sometimes that you throw out numbers that I have to challenge for a minute because I think it helps you learn stuff. Kira, what's the problem with this? the first part of this term? You want the one? 
You know, there's something that's just, well, yes, yes. That's the one you're talking about, right? Because what we just did here is we took 1,000 as our revenue, multiplied it by 1.62, so we created a, an expense value far greater than our revenue. In fact, one and a half times our revenue and then some. So now we have an operating, rev, uh, operating margin that's negative and we're in deep kimchi, right? So we're going to take the 1,000, our new revenue, times the ratio, the multiple, the forecast ratio, and that gives us the forecasted expense based upon the ratio, right? And then we want to take and multiply it by 1 minus the adjustment, 0.01, which somebody said it was 0.99. One of you guys said it. Please, Garrett. The way I understood it, sorry, I thought we were trying to grow revenue with the 1% adjustment. Mm. So would, would my advance have been correct if we were trying to grow revenue? Sorry about that. I, I tried to make this revenue at time one, so it was already grown. Oh, okay. It was already grown. What we were trying to do is find the expense. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I intended that to be the revenue that already had been expanded. I'm pretty confident that if you have a revenue value of X and a increase on it of 8%, you can come up with the next revenue value. Okay, that's the simplest part of this metric. Zach? So I'm just trying, I'm wondering why we wouldn't multiply the percent by the adjustment first before okay. we multiply it by revenue. So you'd like us to do this. Uh, take the 0.62 times uh, 0.99, right? Yeah. And then times a thousand. Does that give us a different outcome or the same outcome? It gives us the exact same outcome. So it doesn't matter what you do. Okay? And what matters is that you have proportionately dealt with it. These two equations are the exact same equation rearranged. Okay, so you could do that just fine. What you don't want to do is take the thousand times 0.62 minus 0 0.01. Why not? Because the, that 0 0.01 is a different, like, if it was out of 100%, then you could do that, but because it's 0 0.62, it, you have to take a percent of a percent. So when you subtract the yeah, so what he's trying to say, and he's saying it properly, of course, is that 0.62 minus 0.01 isn't taking 0.62 and proportionately decreasing it by 1%, which is what Zach's equation has done, and it's actually what my equation has done as well. So you've got to think about these things in proportionalities. Okay? That said, we can think about these assumptions we're making, and if we know our spreadsheet construction well enough, we can adjust them, and we can manipulate them and modify them as we see fit, right? Okay. Why are we worried about forecasting debt? Does EBIT include any notion of debt? Is there any reflection of debt in EBIT? No, none, right? Uh, free cash flow. Does it include any notion of debt? None. Free cash flow is the cash flow we're after in almost every circumstance, right? So why are we worried about debt? Mickle? See, now I'm curious, but well, now I want to know. Okay. Zach? If our, I just think if you're forecasting and looking at valuating a company, if you see that the debt is growing in greater proportion than your future cash flows, that could be a red flag. Okay. So I suggested that firms tend to develop a particular appetite for debt or leverage. And tend to stay fairly consistent with that. So a change might signal something. 
Here? I was going to say, would it indicate what a lot of our um, free cash flow is going to be going toward? I mean, if we have a lot of debt, we're going to be using a lot of our free cash flow to try and pay it off. Uh, yes. Yes, we've made commitments to it, right? Yeah. It would. Before? And it would be reflected in the WAC portion of the DCF one. It's certainly going to have a reflection in WAC, right? Certainly. Which is part of the valuation estimator, but it really doesn't tell us about free cash flow. But we establish WAC in time zero, and we don't change it as we move forward. So it, we don't forecast debt because of it, but it's not completely irrelevant. You're right. So think about this for a minute. If I know that enterprise value is equal to the market cap of, let's just say, equity for a minute. And I'm going to believe that equity is common stock. Let's do this first for a firm that doesn't have any preferred stock. Plus market value of debt minus cash and equivalents. That's the enterprise value. If I believe that, and if I'm trying to figure out equity, because unless this is a publicly held firm, I don't know the market cap of equity, do I? No. I mean, it's all well and good to say that we know this stuff for enterprise value, but unless we know market cap of equity already, we can't find enterprise value in this form. We need to find it in another form. Remove these for a minute. How else can I calculate or estimate enterprise value? So have I suggested that the value or valuation that we're seeking to come up with is an estimation of enterprise value? Yeah. So enterprise value is the value of the asset today, right? And we also know the value of the asset today is the present value of the sum of its future cash flows, however we've defined them. So I can think of creating an estimator that is the value today is equal to the present value of some discounted cash flows. Let's say that those are um, uh, let's say that those are free cash flow plus the present value of some continuing value. That's not at all the surprise to you at this point, right? So now, if we want to try to identify the market value of the firm's common stock in this case, and we have the information that lets us estimate the market value of the debt, which we probably do, if we have a balance sheet, we certainly have cash and equivalents, right? <coughs> Can we not simply rely on the equality between these two, the expected equality? In which case, we can now say that the value at time zero, which we believe we have accurately calculated, is now equal to this. We should be able to do that, shouldn't we? And if I want to calculate the market cap of my equity, I'm simply going to subtract the market cap or market value of the debt from both sides and add cash. And I now know the market value of my equity. Which when you see it like this for the first time, it's almost like, oh. Cool. But it's actually pretty commonsensical if you just thought about it algebraically. We tend not to think about the firm's numeric relationships algebraically. And one of the things that I try to do in this class is to help you start to do that because they have direct relationships. Okay? Well, once I've done that, if I believe this valuation estimate to be accurate, then I now know 
the market cap of my equity to find that as a price per share, I simply take this dollar value divided by the number of shares outstanding. Please. So you may have already touched on this previously, but let's say that you knew the market cap of the equity and you were calculating just the enterprise value, how much like of a variation, or are those going to be the same number? The, um, the value times zero and the enterprise value? Thank you. It's exactly where I was going next. Thank you, Cole. So what you're saying is, this number, have we already shown that it, based upon different ways we estimate it, it's a different number? The firm's estimation using WAC, a would-be investor's estimation using their required rate of return, the FCF model versus the KVD model versus something else I'm about to show you. We've just suggested that this number, as nicely set in stone as we want it to be, may be anything but, right? So how does that affect all of this? Well, it affects this because if I'm in the open market today bidding on a share of Bobby Core, and somebody then owns a share of Bobby Core and is selling it, which price is higher? The one I'm bidding or the one that's being asked? This is asked. So what we're suggesting, and we, and we know that that's the case because we know that the discount rate being used by Bobby Core, the seller, the asker, is less than the discount rate being sought by the buyer, the investor. And that sets up the difference between bid and ask in our marketplaces, right? So based upon the buyer's discount rate, this number will be lower, right? Higher discount rate, lower outcome. The seller's discount rate, this number would be higher. And so there might be a range of market cap that we have to think about based upon whether we're buyers or sellers bid and ask in a competitive market. Very consistent with what you've already learned in your economics courses, right? But it's all a function of that discount rate. We've been to this point once or twice already. We'll probably hit it again before we're done and so on. The difference between what I want to buy it for and you want to sell it for is a difference of discount rate. And I know that as a consumer, back to my problem where I said, Francesca owns a computer and she's willing to sell it for a thousand. If I am willing to pay her a thousand, what she says is my thousand dollars is worth more to her than the computer, right? If I'm willing to pay a thousand, I'm saying that her computer is worth more than a thousand to me. But only because we already reached an agreement. I don't want to pay a thousand for it, I want to pay nine hundred. She didn't want to get a thousand for it, she wants to get eleven $1 hundred. But we had our conversation, we had a handshake, and we settled on a thousand. Okay. So Make sure that you recall that these all live in the same sphere at the same point in time. The negotiation to get to a market price certainly starts with the buyer and the seller being informed with cash flows, with future expectations, but assuming they each have the same knowledge of cash flows and future expectations, then the only thing that yields a different, that can allow us to see a different dollar value for the ask versus the bid is a discount rate. And that discount rate is some expected return, right? What if you see a number, an estimated number, and you think, hmm, that number, I don't know how to adjudicate it. I don't know whether to call it good or bad. It's higher than what I wanted because of where my perspective or it's lower than what I wanted to give my perspective. But I don't know that that in and of itself lets us call it good or bad, does it? Is it possible to rearrange the valuation estimator and solve for the discount rate? It's just an equation, right? And the discount rate is a known variable in the equation. Could we not rearrange and solve for that instead? So if you have some value, and you know you've got discount rates replete within this, if you come up with some value, you might rearrange the estimation equation to solve using this value, using the known cash flows and future expectations, 
but solve for the discount rate. And now you can think about how does that rate of expected return match up or not with your expectations of return for this kind of investment in this kind of market. Would that be, would that be one of your particular decision criteria? We talked about decision criteria a few weeks ago, right? IRR, MIRR, we might have to compare that number to those values as we're trying to make this decision. Does that make sense? We don't spend a lot of time in this class talking about the stock markets. But we kind of do, we just, we just kind of dance around it, right? We're not really a stock market class. But some of you are taking Lawrence Finance 305 simultaneous with this, or you might have already taken it. Some of you might even be in the midst of uh, Rich's uh, 495 or 405, which is, and 405 is all about stock markets, right? Think about being able to use these estimators against known values to be able to determine some items that you can make decisions with. If we can reverse engineer one of these to solve for R, could we instead simply accept a particular discount rate as being one that is reasonable in the market and instead solve for G? Can you see it? That's referred to as finding the G solution. So if I believe that a firm has a reasonable growth expectation or we might be able to apply one of 7%, but I look at its enterprise value, and maybe I found its enterprise value by looking at its market value of equity, market value of debt, minus its cash, because it's a publicly held firm. And if I use all of that information and then the rest of what I know and, and reverse engineer and solve for G or long-term growth, and if that, tends, if that number comes out at 17%, but my expectation as an investor is that this firm really has about a 7, maybe a 10% long-term growth expectation, do I buy it or not? If I find that its value today in the markets is a function of a 17% growth rate because I reverse engineered this and found that 17%, and I think the firm's only got a 7 to 10% expectation, realistically, do I like it and buy it, or do I walk away? What do you think, Brian? I think you'd walk away. I walk away. Why, Michael? Because your expected uh, growth rate is way lower than the market's expected growth rate. Yeah, so the market value has cooked in a growth rate I don't believe. Can you just short it? I could short it. Uh, do, who does not understand the concept of shorting a stock? Do you know it, Cole? Okay, I couldn't tell if that was a... Uh, okay, all right. Yeah, so I can short it. Yeah. By the way, I'm not a big fan of shorting markets. Just so you know. I, I don't think that's investing. I think that might be trading. And it might be betting. But it's not, to me, it's not investing. But that's okay. A lot of, if, for a lot of people, it's exactly what they like to do. Okay. All right. Think about these. We're going to come back to these and, and look at some actual numbers with them later in the term. Okay? All right. So let's, let's move on. Let's talk about the adjusted present value model. To do it, though, I first want to put up the free cash flow model. Value using a free cash flow model is equal to the sum of the free cash flows at times i divided by 1 plus, I'll just say r, to suggest the discount rate, to the t. And r could be WAC or hurdle rate or whatever it is, depending upon our perspective. Plus the free cash flow at time 1 divided by r minus g divided by 1 plus r to the t. We know that the free cash flow at time 1 divided by r minus g is a continuation term. And we're, div we're dividing up by 1 plus r to the t to make it a present value. So we can add a present value to a present value to get a present value, right? So we've looked at what we think are all of the firm's cash flows in the future. And we've given them a present value 
And we said that's the value of the asset. Right? Do you care as a business owner if you get an additional dollar of profit because of an extra dollar of revenue? Or you get an additional dollar of profit because of an extra dollar of cost savings? Because don't they the, both uh, equate yeah. to an additional dollar? Don't, don't they both have the exact same effect on EBIT and operating income and therefore free cash flow, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? I think you don't care. In fact, as new managers, one of the first things a new manager tries to do is look at the cost structure inside of an entity, their department, the whole firm, whatever it happens to be, and they try to manage that and, and bring down prices, costs because it's an easy way to do it, right? But sometimes it's a penny wise and a pound foolish way. So easy might have a connotation you gotta be really careful of. I might end up cutting expense only to really realize that what seemed to be a non-productive expense or an unnecessary expense was very productive. I might have found a way to get two cents per unit off from a particular supplier, thinking that I just saved the day only to then realize I start getting goods from that supplier that are slightly lower quality. Or I've made it harder for that supplier to stay afloat and they go bankrupt and now I've got to find a new supplier. So you've got to really be careful when you start cost cutting. Uh, it's easy to do. It's, it's the first thing new managers do. The more experienced manager starts to look for new revenues. Harder to find, but more productive for you, typically long term. More reliable, persistent. But that's all we're talking about, right? This has no reflection of debt. There's no notion of debt or interest rate or interest expense in free cash flow, is it? What is unique about interest expense that is different than all the other expenses in the firm? Well, they're all deductible against taxable income, right? True there. All qualified expenses are deductible against taxable income. Do we have a lot of control over the interest expense itself? Not really. We get to deduct the interest, just like we get to deduct all other expenses. But does that save something else for us? When we deduct a dollar of interest expense, do we get a dollar of savings or do we get something different than a dollar of savings? Think about taxes. Think about your WAC equation. Why do we apply 1 minus T to the RD section of the WAC equation? Because interest expense is tax deductible. Preferred dividend or preferred costs are not. Equity costs are not. Right? Interest expense is tax deductible. Okay? So that being the case, and this having no tax ramification, no notion of tax, no notion of interest, if we do have interest, do we then also have a, some savings that we wouldn't have had if we didn't have it? So if I've got taxable income of 1,000 because I have operating income of 1,000, that suggests I have no interest expense, right? So my tax, let's say it's at 25%, is going to be equal to 250. But if I have the same operating income of 1,000, but now I have interest expense of 100, now my taxable income is 900, and I think I'm what, at 225 tax? If I'm at a 25% tax rate, is that right? What's 900 times 0.25? Okay, good. Sometimes when I do it at the board, 
I'm less than perfect. You might have noticed that once in a while. Okay? Um, which means now my net income here was 750, but my net income here is what? Uh, 670, no, that's not right. Seven. What? I was right. I was right. Was it? Okay, no. Something's wrong. <coughs> Where is it not? It's not. Okay. an additional expense in the... Yeah, I've got something else going on. You're minus and minus. Okay. Well, no, that's right. Because they're a little bit less than $100 difference. Here I had the extra expense of 100 but it didn't equate to a net income difference of 100 only equated net, net income difference of, uh, of 75. So is it possible that we might want to think about the tax savings we get as another cash flow? Do we care whether we got a dollar from revenue or a dollar from savings? We don't. So we might want to think about it as a cash flow. And that's where the adjusted present value equation comes in. So value based upon the adjusted present value equation. So if present value still, we're going to adjust it for something. What we're going to adjust it for is this savings in taxes. And it equals, I wish I had another pen in here that was not red, because black is not serving us well. Oh, oh, that one. Is just big red. Right, there's a blue one right there. Yeah, I think that's the blue one I didn't like. Let me make sure. Yeah, that's the blue one I didn't like. But it's got the same problem as the black. So values in the APB model is now going to be VFCF plus V tax. So a value using free cash flow and a value using tax savings and adding together. Because we're going to think of both free cash flow and the tax savings as cash flows. So we need to then identify VFCF and V tax. VFCF is equal the sum of the free cash flows times I divided by 1 plus KU to the T plus the free cash flow at time 1 divided by KU minus G divided by 1 plus KU to the T. So it's just like the free cash flow model, right? Ah, except for, what's KU? Well, that's a thing now. KU, that's a thing. And it turns out it's a doggone important thing. KU equals the cost of unlevered equity. Is there anything in free cash flow that even hints at leverage? No, there's not. So we're going to use the cost of unlevered equity. And I'm not going to define the cost of unlevered equity today. I'll define it on Wednesday, OK, it, algebraically. But I want you to start to just think about there might be a difference. And we'll talk a little bit about how that difference might be conceptualized even today. So aside from this pesky little KU versus R thing, or KU versus WAC or whatever, we've got the exact same equation for VFCF as we do for the free cash flow values. Which shouldn't surprise you because we're taking the present value of all the future free cash flows divided by 1 plus a discount rate, and we're calling that some value, and in this case we're calling it VFCF. Okay? PV, DCF. PV, CV, using free cash flow in both cases. 
What about VTAX? How do you think we might find VTAX? Do, Garrett? Substitute the factor for KU. Okay, we're going to substitute some other discount rate for KU. Only this time, we're going to think of K-tax. K-tax. What would K-tax mean? If KU is the cost of unlevered equity, what do you suppose K-tax is? Taxes on costs that are in equity. Well, it would be the opportunity cost of paying taxes, right? to cost paying taxes. Okay. Well, we already know how to define free cash flow pretty well. We've defined it 100 times together. We're, are we going to use free cash flow in this second part of the equation in VTAX? We don't want to double count, do we? That, that's, that's trouble. How might we define algebraically the savings that we receive from paying interest. Think back to Finance 300. I know that you dealt with this. Do you remember the term tax shield? Does anyone recall how to calculate it? It's actually very simple. In fact, deceptively so. Tax shield equals the interest expense paid times the tax rate. So if I've got a 25% tax rate and I've got $100 of interest, just like we had in our example, it's going to save me $25, right? Just like we had in our example. Okay. So that's a cash flow. So V tax is simply the sum of the tax shields at times I divided by the 1 plus K tax to the T plus the tax shield at time one divided by one plus K tax to me. K tax minus G divided by one plus K tax to the T. The only thing conceptually different about the adjusted present value model and the free cash flow models is the recognition of another source of cash flow. This time being a tax savings resulting from there being an interest expense. If there's no interest expense, if its expense is zero, then the tax yield is zero and V tax goes away, and we're left with the free cash flow model. Brigham, was that a hand? You just answered it. I was, okay. I was just going to ask the exact same equations. So they really are. Yeah. Because this KU, the cost of unlevered equity, if I don't have debt in the company, if all I have is equity, isn't whack an unlevered equation? Because there is no D to divide by V to get the last part of the equation as a value, right? Garrett? Can you, can you repeat that first part again? Maybe. What did I say? That um, whack isn't... Um... Yeah, okay, yes, now I can because I wasn't sure which was the first part you're referring to. All right. So think about this. The whack equation. E divided by V times RE. So that's unlevered, right? It's equity. I might have to think about that plus P divided by V times RP is the cost of, the weighted cost of preferred stock. Is preferred stock reflective of leverage? Well, not expressly. I mean, you can think of it that way because that dividend must be paid, but it's not expressly debt. It's equity. It's not debt. It can't be both at the same time. So we call it equity plus D divided by V times RD times 1 minus T, right? That's the rest of the equation. 
Well, if D is zero, no debt, then D divided by V is undefined, and the rest of that term still equals zero. So in that case, WAC, when there is no debt, is the unlevered cost of equity. Does that make sense? We may have to explore that again in a minute because there's something going on there that's actually kind of interesting that isn't immediately obvious, okay? Knowing the unlevered cost of equity is important to us because we would like to think about how a firm's leverage affects value for its stakeholders. But unfortunately, we don't ever get to really observe unlevered equity, just like we don't really get to observe RE. And you'll remember the cap M equation for RE. There's a somewhat similar equation for KE, or the cost of equity, which we think of, well, I don't have, I don't have some room here, but we think of RE as being the opportunity cost of equity, right? We have a cap M equation for it. But there's another way of thinking about it that is KE. It's got a whole equation all by itself that looks a lot like the cap M equation. And again, I'll introduce the equation to you on Wednesday, okay? rather than try to shove it into your minds with all this other stuff today. So we'll define each of these. I want to think about how they're affecting us. Let's come back for a minute to the opportunity cost of paying taxes. If I have a dollar of expense from uh, debt, interest expense, and it goes away from me, I pay it out, do I expect to get anything back for having paid it? Garrett? Less interest payments, maybe? Um, yeah, yeah, I, we do. If I pay a dollar of interest, I don't have that dollar to pay anymore. But I'm, I'm not sure that's satisfying. What I want to get back, I want to get back something that's warm and fuzzy, right? Rather than just less of something that's not. Now, I know you might say, well, same thing. That's what we're talking about here. That it's a little bit different connotation I'm looking at. Didn't I already get the benefit before I'm paying the interest? So I've already gotten the benefit, and the benefit was having your money to use, and I'm now paying you interest, right? Okay. When I pay a dollar in tax, what's the benefit that I get? Just goes away, right? Nickel? Public schools, roads, infrastructure. Oh, but, but I'm a capitalist pig. <laughs> I, um, in fact, I, I stand with, um, I stand with the far right, and I'm a libertarian. I, I don't have children any longer at home, so I don't care about education, public education. I already had all of mine. Uh, frankly, I don't use most of the roads around, so I, I care about 13th East, 215, and well, 13th East. Because those are pretty much the only roads I spend my time on. As long as those are cared for, I don't care about the roads you guys are on. Not doing good on 13th. Pardon? Yeah. <laughs> well, we're certainly paying money for it right now, right? Um, do, I, do I get a benefit? Well, Michael's right, of course. Right. But as taxpayers, when you sign the check, my guess is none of you have had the experience of signing a income tax check that you're a payment to the IRS in April or whenever. You've had a little bit of it come out of your paychecks, and hopefully you're getting and you think you're gonna get some back, if 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 anything, right? But there will come a time when you will write a substantial check when you file your income tax return because you didn't have enough taken out. And some of you, that will not be measured in the thousands or tens of thousands, at some point somebody in here is going to write one measured in the six figures. Okay? And when you write that, are you thinking about all the great benefit you get, or are you just thinking, well, I just whiz that away? Right? 
Mason? That's what we're thinking. Thinking, okay, money I used to have, I don't need more. Well, I hope those guys in Washington enjoy it because I'm certainly not going to. Isn't that kind of the way we think? But Nicholas, is that the right way to think? Norway. Yeah. Pardon me? You Norway. Yeah, from Norway. Yeah. No, I asked him purposely. I asked him purposely. <coughs> that is the wrong way to think, yes. Okay. It's the wrong way to think. Um, fire department has never showed up in my house to put out a fire. No, it really hasn't. Um, the, the police department in the house that I currently live in, I've lived there for almost 13 years, has never been to my house. Uh, for anything other than because I have a couple of friends that are cops, okay? I don't invite politicians to my home, as a general rule, unless they're already personal friends. I don't seek to make personal friends of most of them, <laughs> for whatever reason. But it just doesn't sound well, especially if I have a lot of videotape, does it? <laughs> <laughs> I used to write an economic column every week, about seven or eight years. And it was a, it was a subscription thing, it went out to about 30,000 paid subscribers. Yeah, across the country. I did this as part of my, my firm. And uh, yeah, it wasn't bad. I mean, we, it took years to get to that point. Uh, and a guy by the name of Bob Bennett, uh, who some of you will recognize his name, was a subscriber. And I've known uh, Bob for many years since he'd been the, uh, the president of Franklin Covey. Or Franklin, or, uh, yeah, Franklin Covey. And one day I send one of these things out, and it wasn't 10 minutes later. I get a email from a guy named Chip Yost, who's his head legislative guy, and says, do you have to do this every time? And I'm paraphrasing now. Do you have to be so hard on politicians? Do you not realize that we get this? We, we're getting your, your call and your thing. And my response to Chip was, well, of course I realize that. Why do you think I wrote it? So, um, We think about tax as a sunk cost. We typically are frustrated when we pay taxes, forgetting that we do get something back for them. I'm driving down the road. Yeah, 13th East is not so pleasurable right now, but it'll be better, right? I didn't have cops show up to my home because there are police officers in my area and they help keep crime away. I didn't have to show up, I didn't have a fire department in front of my house because when the, a house three doors down was on fire, they showed up there and it didn't spread to my house, right? Uh, I didn't have to worry about a, um, a fire department showing up to my ranch in Idaho uh, earlier this summer because a fire about 20 miles away was contained there and didn't get to my place. It was far away, it never got to my place. Uh, I have public schools. Yeah, I don't have kids in public school anymore, but I certainly benefited from it, right? As most of us have. We can't forget that we have benefit from paying taxes. But it's not what we think about to begin with, is it? We think just the opposite. So what's the opportunity cost of paying tax? Well, I'd have to figure first, what benefit do I get for paying taxes? I have to quantify it for me. And then I'd have to consider that against other benefits I could have gotten for the same dollar, and then I can come up with a rate, right? Good luck. Zach? Do you take fees from the IRS into account, like fines, like for tax evasion if you get caught? Does that fine? Oh, I think you would have to, because at some point you're going to pay the piper. I, mean, I, I don't know anyone that successfully, openly evades the IRS for meaningful periods of time. Oh, a little bit here and there, because they don't look that closely. But almost everybody gets audited at some point. I've never been audited, so I'm not going to wait. Never had an IRS audit personally. I've had, I had a business in New York, so. so it's really hard to come up with V-tax, or uh, K-tax, because Kira gets one benefit for a tax dollar. Mickle gets a different for a tax dollar. I get a different for a tax dollar. And I don't think any of us could accurately quantify the benefit we get for tax dollars. Because so much of it isn't obvious to us. And because of this attitude most of us have, certainly in America, for not wanting to pay tax. Okay. So I said the KU cost of unloaded equity might be a little challenging. K tax a little bit challenging. We're going to learn in a few days with another one, KD. 
but the cost of levered equity, a little bit challenging to calculate, these are very theoretical. Okay? Each one is going to have an equation, but you need to understand these are very theoretical. So very often, we make a simplifying assumption. That simplifying assumption is that k-tax is equal to ku is equal to WAC. I don't want to suggest that that is a credible or a qualified assumption. But for the purposes of this class, excuse me, when you are doing a problem set that might have adjusted present value in it, that's the assumption you're allowed to use because I don't expect you to calculate KU, KTAX, or KB. They're challenging if possible. Okay? And by the way, everything we're talking about at the moment is a byproduct of Medigliani and Miller theorems. And you know those names, you don't perhaps remember what they did. Those were Nobel laureates that uh, want some pretty good look at hardware and some money because they came up with some really interesting thoughts. Okay. Well, think about this. If value free cash flow and value APV are credible models, and if we assume our discount rate in this model and our discount rates in this model are the same, if there is debt and if there is interest expense, we're going to come up with two different valuations, aren't we? Well, because they both used free cash flow, so that means that our value using the adjusted present value model is going to be higher than our value using the free cash flow model should the value for the same firm be any different one model to the next? It's the same firm. Same cash flows in the future, right? So they should be the same. Under what conditions then? Now think about K-tax and KU compared to WAC. Under what conditions would the free cash flow model and the APV model be the same? Knowing that the free cash flows are the same and that V tax and the tax shield isn't accounted for in this model. Under what conditions will they be, the numbers be the same? You said tax shield and your free cash flows aren't equal? Well, free cash flow and free cash flow are equal. Well, tax shield isn't in here. Right. So there is a tax, there's a cash flow built into the APV model that is not in the free cash flow model. And if the discount rates are the same, then these will give different values because of, there's a more cash flow, right? So how do we think about reconciling these for them to be the same value? Cole, you had a hand and we'll come over. You couldn't have any debt or like, interest. Well, I'm saying we do have debt. Oh, you're saying? Yeah, it's there. Nickel? Oh, yeah. If your tax rate is zero, I guess? Yeah, well, well yes. Okay, so Medigliani and Miller's theorems. Did you say that because you recall the theorem? Oh, well, you're very close, by the way. Medigliani and Miller's theorems, which is what gave us our E being equal to P0 divided by D1 plus G. Remember that version of our E? Subordinate to the cap M version, but it's there, right? The Medigliani and Miller theorems work in a world with no taxes and no interest rate. So zeros for that. Doesn't K tax be equal to your discount rate? Say that one more time, please. K tax is equal to your discount rate? Not expressly, but if K tax plus KU is equal to WAC, now what happens? If this value, so for K tax and KU be, to be plus KU to be equal to WAC, they both have to be less than or they have to be less than WAC, right? So if KU is less than WAC, what happens here? KU is less than the this term is smaller. That makes the value of this whole term bigger. So if I 
So if it's bigger, well now I just compounded the issue, didn't I? So I can't make that assumption. I have to think about K tax being greater than whack and KU being greater than whack. Let me think about that then. If I've got KU being greater than whack, the value of this term, of all of this, is now going to be a, bit, a little bit less than it was up here, right? And if this then has also a discount rate that is greater than whack, then this is small, and maybe this plus this now equal this. So the assumption that I allow you to make, just for simplicity's sake in the problem sets, I need you to, which is k, k tax is equal to ku is equal to whack, that creates a different value as an outcome for the equation, and it's not realistic. I only do it to make it simpler for you to calculate things. So you don't have to also find k tax, ku, and kd. Okay? But it must be that k tax and ku combined at least have to be greater than whack. So I think what we would say is k tax plus kd must be, excuse me, KU must be greater than whack. If that's the case, now Val FCF and Val APV can, can perhaps have the same value, the same number. Am I being a little too theoretical for you? Are we okay? Did you, did you say for our purposes we'll use K tax, KU equals whack? Well, yes. Okay. Yeah. I, in fact, I even think I say that in the problem sets. And if I don't, if, I, if you don't notice it, I believe that in each of the problem sets that you would use this, you're allowed to make that assumption. So I want you to know that when you make that assumption, it sets up a different value based upon these two estimators. And is there a good reason that they should be different? Can I help? Are we going to well, I'm just asking, um, so the, kind of what Mick was saying, for this class we're using the K tax equals KU equals K whack. But my question is why are we going into more detail on the other one? Is that just what it normally would be? Or maybe I'm missing Say that one more time, please. So for this class, you say we're just going to stick with K tax equals KU equals whack, right? Okay. And so my question is why are we going into more detail on the other ones? Is that just what it would be in the real world? Yeah, I'm simply trying to help you understand that in our course, that's, this I will almost always only require this, okay. but I'm trying to tell you it's not realistic. And the only reason that I don't go to calculating K tax and K U more simple. is because A, I don't know how to calculate a universal K tax. I might be able to figure cures. Maybe Mickles, maybe my own, if I can accurately quantify the benefit out value of the goods and services the government delivers to me. But I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to value the government benefit that I get when I take um, Simvastatin, which is a, uh, a pharmaceutical that was developed at a university based upon a government grant to that university. But even for you, it would Possible, right? Because you can go quite far out. So if you look at your tax benefit, right? You can well, look at I postman, what he did growing up, and why he. And then thank you. Look at his mom, and then her mom, and then yeah. It becomes. It becomes so difficult as to be unrealistic. I mean, and that's your point, right? Because the ramifications, the ripples, the externalities. So. Then I'm asking, why would you ever use it in the, or how would you ever figure it out in the real world? Is it just a would you ever assumption? Well, there is a way. Flat average? No, I can do some reverse engineering. I can make an assumption, and you'll, and when we actually, when I actually go through the equations with you, because I do want you to see them, you'll realize there are some of these we can do some assumptions for, but others that we can't and we can reverse engineer and solve for the ones we can't. 
make the assumptions. Part of why we talked about can we solve for G, can we solve for R. You can, if you think about being able to reverse engineer to find input values, now you can do that more li liberally elsewhere. If, you, if you're kind of in the mindset of thinking about that. So the idea of this model is to add what you save on interest or taxes to your... Yes. So, Be, so the free cash flow as a cash flow has no interest effect, no tax effect, so right? Could we just, is there a way to just alter the free cash flow model for, to include the, the, like what you, like what you save on tax? Ah, yes. If you think that the discount rate that you would apply to cash flow yeah. and the discount rate you would apply to taxes are the same rate, then you can simply say that VAPV is FCFI plus TSI divided by 1 plus the discount rate to the T plus FCF1 plus TS1 divided by discount rate minus G. And so now you've got a singular equation, which you could do if you're using this assumption. Because we're setting them. Yeah, but if they're not equal, well, I guess you could say plus KU plus K tax. But that's effectively what we've done. Okay. I'm pretty sure if I had written the equation uh, saying the discount part of each of this was 1 plus KU plus K tax would have made it harder for you to see that the form of the equation is the exact same form. That's part of why it's written this way. And if you look at McKinsey, by the way, or uh, and there's only a few finance texts out there that even talk about the adjusted present value model. Uh, if you look at them, you won't see them say that it equals VFCF plus VTAX. You'll see that it goes directly to this. It'll just be like this. I break it apart because I think if you can see that this part of the equation standing along is almost identical to the model that we know, and it's just adding another cash flow. I just think it makes it a little easier for you. And the first halves of both of those are the both two present values, and then the second halves are two present values of the continuing values? I'm not sure I understand what you mean by first half. Okay, so on the, the two parts of each of the equations, right? Okay, so this part? That part, and then... And that part. Yeah, those okay. are... Those are present values of cash. the free cash flows during the explicit period. Okay, and then those are both two different models of present value and continuing values, right, on the right side? Present value of the explicit cash flows plus present value of the continuation term plus the present value of another explicit cash flow plus the present value of its continuation term. They're all, they're all present values. When we have that one plus some discount rate to the power of t, that makes it a present value, right? That is the present value function. A little ethereal, isn't it? So come back for a minute. Why might we think about this sometimes? Do most companies not have debt and effectively be valued. I like to think most companies have some kind of debt. I think most companies have some kind of debt. Oh, there are some, right? But the vast majority, even Alphabet and Apple, with combined, they've got like half a trillion dollars of cash on the balance sheets. So Google and Apple. They have debt. By the way, if, I, if you've got in Apple's case, $262 billion in cash on the balance sheet. That's the last number I saw. Why would you bother having debt? Well, there's that idea where some, like, once you owe someone a certain amount of money, you have control over them. But well, there's that. I hadn't thought about that, by the way, but there is that. So, like, if they have a bunch of debt to suppliers, I think that would make them... Possibly, but the debt to suppliers typically is account payable. We don't, that's not the kind of debt we're talking about, right? We're talking about capital debt. But, you know, if, uh, if, if I owe somebody some money, I know that our interests are now somewhat aligned. They're not going to kill me off because if they kill me off, they're never going to get paid, right? That's what you're talking about. What else? 
Um, well, I like having a tax shield, but a dollar I pay in tax only saves me 25 cents. I prefer not to have the dollar. Or a dollar I pay in interest saves me 25 cents in tax. I'd prefer not to have paid the dollar, right? Why else? How? Well, compared to common stock, your debt is more consistently, and then the interest rate is already set there. You just need to pack You just have to pay the interest every year. So, so you're, you're talking about the fact that RD in our current market climate is less than RE. The cost of interest in the market today is less than the opportunity cost of equity, right? Is it always that way? But if you have half a trillion dollars on the balance sheet or whatever, why do you need to raise new capital at all? Okay, that's a good question. And it, it's part of what we're answering. But if it's less expensive for me to have debt than equity, then I like that I that I may raise debt. I could just take some of that cash and buy back equity. Do companies ever buy back their stock with okay. cash? Yes, they do. Why? Why do they do it? Yeah. Well, does it have anything to do with like? I don't know if it would matter for Apple because they're so big, but like controls and voting rights and being able to look at your equity. I, you know, I think my answer is I don't know, just because I haven't really thought that far about that element. I think there's some possible issues there, but I don't know. I think that the difference between the cost of debt in our market today and the cost of equity is relevant. I think that the difference between, or, or I think I, I, I might have a bunch of money on the balance sheet and that I could pay out in dividends, right? I keep it on the balance sheet because if I paid it all out in dividends, then the next time I see a $100 million opportunity, I can't afford to immediately get it. I have to go raise money to get it, and that may take too long, right? Uh, so there's that. Uh, if I pay off, if I buy back stock using money on the balance sheet or by raising debt, what does that do to me? Well, if RE is greater than RD, it helped me there. If my return on my cash, though, is also less than RE, it helped me there. So those are, that's a plausible reason. We're going to look at a leverage buyout model, which is akin to what you're talking about, in a few weeks. But there's one other issue that's avoiding us at the moment. We recently changed <coughs> corporate income taxes in this state, or this country. They used to be, had a maximum of, I think, aggregation of maybe 35 point something percent, and now they're 21 percent. What was the single primary motivator to doing that, to that tax chain? Cole? To bring more industry here, or to like keep companies headquartered here? For Keeping them here, and we have companies like Apple and Alphabet and many others that have substantial profits in their foreign holdings. So Apple UK, perhaps, substantial profits that have not been repatriated. Because if they're repatriated to the US, you have to pay tax on them, right? Well, they're more likely to be repatriated with a 21% tax than with a 35% tax, right? So I might have cash on the balance sheet of the whole company, but maybe some of it exists in my Asian subsidiary, and I want to use money in the US to build a new factory. So it might be cheaper for me to borrow new money in the capital markets, or maybe even raise equity with stock, perhaps, than it would be to repatriate those profits from another country, my own company, but another country. So it's all a function of cost. You have to always be willing to think about that. This issue of repatriating profits is a big, big deal. In fact, there's an entire industry that I'll bet you at least one of you will deal with someday. It's called transfer pricing energy. It's transfer pricing. Where we think about fair market value of transferring assets, whether it's cash or something else, back to another uh, polity. And if you, if you transfer it back at fair market value, everybody's good. But if you transfer it back at not fair market value, it's actually called tax evasion. So the whole consultancy about how you value the assets are being transferred. There's a company that you'll at some point probably be familiar with. 
by the name of Economic Partners in Salt Lake, and they that's what they do. And they have a, now a subsidiary firm by the, they used to be called Greener Equity, which is a valuation consultancy generally, but Economic Partners in Salt Lake is a transfer pricing company, one of the, one of the most well respected in the country. And they hire people that know these things that you're, that you're dealing with. All right. How many of you know Mike Bumbanos? Mike went to work for them this year. They went to work for their valuation consultancy rather than transfer pricing, but I'm not sure that's true. Do you know? I get confused. Yeah. Does, he go, does he go down to work in Utah County or does he work? Okay, he works for the valuation consultancy then because the transfer pricing entity is insulting. All right. Also, I want to talk about with respect to this. This is very intangible, right? Very theoretical, very abstract. But you know this part. So the only thing abstract about it is KU. And you were able to think through this part. You know what tax shield is. So the only thing really abstract about it still is K-tax. And that's probably going to remain pretty abstract in terms of It's hard to put your finger on. Any questions about any of this? Does it make the free cash flow model more imperfect because we're not accounting for it? That's a really good question. So knowing that this model form ignores this cash flow, and having agreed, as we did, that the vast majority of firms have some interest expense and therefore have a tax shield, does the free cash flow model still hold water? Well, I can answer it by saying the vast majority of valuators use the free cash flow model and not the adjusted present value model. The, the reason is it's far easier to calculate WAC or to recognize a would-be investor's required return than it is to think about KU and K-tax. They're not only abstract to us here in the class today, they're abstract, period. They come from a Modigliani and Miller Nobel laureate thinking in the ethos kind of higher level sort of stuff. How many of you have ever listened to or spoken to a Nobel laureate? Any of you? There's a conference at the University of Utah on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Joseph Stiglitz, some of you will recognize his name, Joseph Stiglitz, that's some people pronounce it, uh, spoke. And, and I, took, I took an MBA class to listen to him. To him. Interesting guy. I had a chance on Thursday evening at a reception, and then again Friday evening after a dinner that some of us were invited to, to actually talk to him a little bit. Interesting guy. The way he thinks and the way you think are really no different. He just is, has time on his hands where he can get into all the abstractions and into the higher order stuff. Part of what's get, what he gets paid to do, right? He gets not think any differently than he does otherwise. So most use free cash flow. So here's what I think. I think if we could pinpoint KU and K-tax, it would be a better model. But I think it is so challenging that we don't do it. So is there any way to account for the taxes not paid as it added to free cash flow to where we could use it more reliably, or is that the only way? There's not. At least not that I'm aware of. And here's part of why. If When we think about uh, WAC, what tax rate do we use in the one minus T? No, that's no plat. And no plat is completely void of taxes because it's got to do with operating income and tax hasn't come into the equation yet. We use tax rate on taxable income, right? We don't use the tax rate that's reflective of the tax you paid versus your taxable income. We were pretty clear about that a number of weeks ago, but it's been a few it's been a little while. So we use the tax rate on taxable income. So that's got the same problem the tax rate on EBIT does. Neither of them are likely reflective of the tax we actually paid. If I start using the tax we actually pay, now I bring into the equation to value the asset discretionary decisions made on the part of the firm's management that have nothing to do with the day-to-day -day operation of the company. And I've introduced into the company's value, so it's got nothing to do with the operation of the company. And, I'll, and now I'm in trouble, right? So almost always, just like in the KVD model, we're using free cash flow. Okay. 
do I recall correctly that coming up very quickly, you guys have a responsibility to be thinking about the paper that's due at the end of the term? In fact, I think you guys have to give me a outline to it, right? That, hasn't, that assignment hasn't come up yet, has it? I thought it was coming up. So here's something to know. Um, next week, I'm here on Monday, and I'm on an airplane on Wednesday. And because I'm taking a group of MBA students to Milan and Rome, and uh, we leave before our class starts. Okay. So I show class on, uh, on Wednesday, but we're not going to have class on Wednesday. And then you do have class on the following Monday and Wednesday, but I'm not going to be here. Somebody else will be here instead. And then I get back, well, actually I get back at the start of the fall break, but you guys are going away, so. Well, no, that trip ends at the start of fall break. I don't get back but during fall break, so I'm going to Paris at the end of the NBA trip, okay? And you guys will have somebody with you on the following Monday, and so not, not this coming Monday and Wednesday, but the next one. Um, and working on some assignments. So I want you to use next Wednesday to deal with your, uh, your um, uh, outline of your paper if you haven't started to deal with it. So let's talk about your paper. What's the title of it? Do you remember? Um, or, yeah, how about firms value assets? You can alter that, but that's, you know, that's, that's what we're looking at. How do firms value assets? I think, and you might want to take note of this, I think that a good essay on how firms value assets probably starts off with a brief discussion of book value, market value, and production value. I think you know where book value comes from, right? It's what the firm pays for an asset minus accumulated depreciation. Pretty straightforward. It's an accounting term, right? How do we come upon market value? We show how much the asset worth right now. How do I identify its worth right now in a market sense, Sherry? What someone is willing to pay for it. Somebody's willing to pay for it. So if it's the computer that you and I, you have it to sell, I want to buy one, whatever the price was we agreed is the market value of that computer, right? So the most recent transaction that took place sets the market value of any given asset. Well, some assets don't have regular market transactions like privately held assets. Uh, stock and firms are privately held. So we think about their value as being production value, don't we? And what we're talking about with all our valuation models is production value. That's all it is. Because the asset, it might produce transmissions or airplanes, or widgets, or boots, or legal services, but at the end of the day, if we're investors, and we're just thinking, thinking as passive investors, it produces cash flow, right? Regardless of what else it produces. And honestly, as an investor, as long as what the company produces tangibly is legal, honest, and ethical, I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's a shoe, or tacos, or nuclear power plants. Other than I don't invest in food because it's fast as I know who's money. All right, investing in restaurants. Um, it was cash flow. So production value is what we've been talking about every time we've been together, except for the first couple of times we were really establishing book values and market and thinking about market. So I think you're gonna have a discussion about that, and then you're gonna go through and you're going to give me a rigorous description. Um, I think the assignment asked for two of them, if I remember correctly. Uh, but maybe, I, I can't remember right now if it asked for two or three. Um, but the, the assignment will give you the detail. But you're going to give me a rigorous discussion of the number of mo uh, models that the assignment asks for. And if I remember correctly, there's, you've got to do one or two specifically, and then there's a third one that you have some discretion on. You can choose which one it's going to be. Um, but look at, again, look at the details of the assignment. You're going to give me a rigorous discussion. You're going to give me the model form. You're going to give me the inputs to the model. You're going to talk about how those inputs affect the model form and its outcome. You're going to talk about how changes in the inputs affect the model form and its outcome. You probably want to be prepared to even talk about the differences in value using one model versus another and why those values differ. 
what assumptions cause the values to differ. Or another stated otherwise, what assumptions could cause the models to equal to have the same valuation. And that's probably more than a paragraph per each of the models. I believe you have 1,500 words that you must provide in order to get the minimum points for, for the word count part of the rubric. You'll see that part of the rubric is word count. If you do 1,500 words exactly, you'll get 70% of that part of the rubric score. And, but there's six or seven other items in the rubric that are at least as important. Okay? In fact, a few of them more important. But if you do the minimum required, then you'll get the minimum points for whatever that required element provides. Okay? I want you to show me the equations. Now, you're able to handwrite them, take a photograph of that, and embed it in your paper. Or you're welcome to go into any one of my Word documents where they're already specified and copy and paste. You do not need to use citations for anything you receive in class that is on Canvas for the class. If you go outside of class and pull something anew, citations. And I don't care if it's APB style or what, I want to be able to find it. When you say in class, for example, on Canvas, there's a lot of stuff you've shared that obviously link to YouTube and other stuff. Do you still want to cite in that? Or Any, anything, that you yeah, can... good question. Anything that is YouTube that I created, anything that is document that's in there, that I put in there and created for you, you don't have to cite. Anything that's part of our basic material in Canvas, you don't have to cite. If it's some supplemental resource, or if you went out and found it elsewhere, cite it. No, just adding to oh. that, so like the, the, the motor and videos, if we look at those. And I think you find the motor and, you don't have to cite the motor. Well, I think you should say, Oswald the motor and says this, but I don't yeah. need to see a reference. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. Because it's like linked in Canvas and part of the course. Yeah, if it's part of the course, it's fair game. Okay. Okay, you don't need, because this is not a rigorous research paper where I'm, asked, where I'm trying to get you to learn about APB citations. I want a citation, so if you cite it, and I disagree with it, I want to see what you cited and why you thought it was credible. So it didn't cost you what it might have otherwise cost you. Okay? That's what I'm after. So the last part of this is a conclusion, right? Here's where more people lose more points than any other on this assignment. And I've had hundreds of students give me this kind of essay. They give me great intros. All good papers have an intro, right? And in the intro, you tell me what you're going to talk about by concept. And then they give me really good text. You know, book value, market value, production value. Here's when they're all the same. Here's why they're different. Uh, this model, that model, the other. And then some skimpy little puny ass little conclusion. Okay? About a statement and a half couched in as small a paragraph as they can possibly find. Because they're out of steam by then. You just want to be done, right? Don't do it. Conclusions are where you help the reader know that you actually understand what you're talking about. It's because where you put concepts together and where you evidence the collect or the connective tissue. Okay? Don't give me a skimpy little conclusion. This is where you're going to impress me with your artistry, of which you're only partially developed at this point. But the whole thing's not due for a few months out. So. So all I'm looking for in this assignment that's coming up while I'm gone is an outline. And if you were taking notes, I just wrote it for you, I think, or something like that. Okay. And if you pay attention in class like most of you are, I mean all of you are, I've been writing your papers since the first day of class. Well, we'll continue to do it. Is that why you record? No, it's not. I record. Yeah, good question. Um, no, I, it's not. I've been recording these these semesters, just like I'm doing with my other classes, because sometimes somebody can't come, and it's a it's a credible reason, and we cover so much material sometimes. I don't want them to get any more lost than they already are. And you guys, even if you're here, sometimes I go through things fairly rapidly sometimes, and it's a resource for you to go back to and. I know he said this about KU, but I have no idea what he was talking about. And you can then go back to today's video and realize he still don't know what I'm talking about, and you don't need to. Okay. All right. Anything else for today, guys?
We're all clear. We're all good. So it's next Wednesday that you're out? Next Wednesday we won't have class. The 10th. I and mean, that's next Wednesday. And then I think the 15th and 17th, I'm gone, but you guys are still in session. And somebody else will be with you. Okay. All right. Also, we're doing this at the Oh, great question. A couple other things. Thank you. Um, if you have an idea that you want to pursue in this, and you don't know if I'm going to appreciate it or not, send me an email. I'll tell you. And I'll even go so far as to tell you that if you send me your draft essay a week or more in advance of the day that it's due, I'll try to, I will at least skim it and give you some comments back before the due date. It may be the day before the due date, okay? The sooner I get it, the sooner you get comments back from me, right? I'll do that. Is it possible? Wait. What is due now? It's not the entire essay, right? Right. Just I'm saying, I'm, yeah, yeah, but I'm, I'm talking about when it's the end of the semester. <laughs> so if a week before the essay is due, or more, if you give me a draft of the essay, I'll at least skim it and give you some commentary. I won't rewrite it for you. I'll say, hmm, you've said such and such, you might want to think about this, just to motivate you to explore. Or you've evidence this, no, I don't know where you got that from. Okay. But um, how like, in-depth of an outline do you look for? Because some professors, in my experience, want one that's like, basically, if you got rid of the outline formatting, you'd have a cohesive essay, and others just want, like, tell me what you're going to talk about. Yeah, actually write that's a good down. question. So obviously, if you simply took note of what I said and put that on paper, that would get the job done, right? I would like to see that you're thinking about it, not just parroting it. Okay? I don't need to see the entirety of it. I don't need to think that you've thought through every element yet, because in some respects, we haven't even talked about some of these elements yet, right? So, so it's, it's short of how far it might have gone, but I want it to be enough where I can tell you're thinking about it. What's the purpose of me asking you to do the outline now? So you start thinking about yeah, it? Yeah, forcing you to think about it. Okay. This actually is a cohesive whole. This outline, or rather this essay, is the class. The whole thing. Okay. All right, we're clear.